This is Father Joseph Anthony Cress. And this is Father Patrick Briscoe. Welcome to God's Planning. If you enjoy this episode and would like to support us, please see the link in the description in the show notes to our Patreon page where you can become a patron and support our work that we are doing here on God's Planning. So Father Patrick, we are coming into December and we're coming to the close of the semester. Now, for the majority of us, uh, Dominican friars, you know, it's the academic year that kind of dictates our life. And we live by it. And a lot of people will have some experience, whether they have kids in, in school or our listeners are in college, know that, okay, there's a little bit of stress at the end of the semester preparing for Christmas break. But you have a unique experience here because this is pretty much your first year not on the academic calendar and the work that you're engaged in. So uh, talk to me a little bit about what this experience is like uh, preparing for uh, Christmas, but not being so influenced by an academic calendar in that way. Yeah, that's true, because I only teach one one class here at the seminary, the practicum class. Ooh. I lead the deacons through how to do all of the sacraments. It's not, um, it, it's really fun. I, I <laughs> love doing that class. Such a, it's such a tremendous privilege. There's lots of editorializing, as you might imagine, as Never far guessed. as how I believe the rights of the church should be conducted. Of course, my students, the friars here, learn the laws of Holy Mother Church. Okay, good. In good. order, in order <laughs> to conduct the sacraments correctly, to say, for example, the critical words of baptism, "I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit." Okay, Important. so they very good. They learn these things, right? Uh, but it's not a rigorous class in the way that other classes are demanding mm -hmm. here. I'm not yeah. teaching grace or Christology, right? It's not the not the big one. So you're right to say that I, I live I live kind of on the periphery of the academic world. Yeah. So over at our Sunday Visitor in newspaper land, things become very condensed around the holiday season okay. because unlike other kinds of journalism, we're still creating a print product, mm -hmm. right? So we have our weekly newspaper, which gets distributed to, uh, to our, our many subscribers. And the people that print the newspapers, I was kind of surprised to learn, want to take holidays. <laughs> <laughs> and so our, our print schedule condenses, and it's a, it's a little bit frantic here for the next month as we, as we make all of our deadlines mm -hmm. and continue to put our, our product in people's hands. So a little bit more frenetic, actually. Oh, wow. I think is, is, gonna, is what my experience is going to be of the holidays, but uh, not because of the academic calendar. No, no, it's, it's still good, and it's just a different way to enter into the season and, and recognize that like there's an importance to what we are preparing for. And, uh, just, a, it's a different mode, if you will. It, it doesn't mean that it's less important or anything like that. So, uh, would you prefer the academic schedule or would you prefer what you got now? Granted, I know yeah, this is your first yeah, time yeah, going through yeah, it. Yeah, so yeah, I'm yeah. asking, you know, things, but like your, your take on it right now. Yeah. So I, um, you know, I don't know if a confession like this is really appropriate for the show, but I'm I'm a news junkie, so uh, conveniently now it's my apostolate, <laughs> which means <laughs> Lord can, provides, right? That's right. Which Lord means, knows you more, and He provides for you, it's which beautiful. means I can I can I can rationalize that, I can justify my Twitter doom scrolling, saying this is this is research, this is important attention to news cycles, and it's necessary for my job. Um, which is kind of true. <laughs> it's true some, certainly. Definitely. So I think that uh, I think that the, the the really exciting thing about Catholic journalism is like every 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 other kind of journalism, it doesn't stop during okay. the cycle. Um, and so for me, really, the key, you know, like like so many of our listeners, is finding how to balance the things that don't let up mm -hmm. over the holidays. Um, finding finding how to balance those things while making time for the things that, that really do matter, right? So that I'm being attentive to the way that Christ is at work in my life in these, in these privileged days of Advent so that I don't waste them. That's, that's beautiful. That's important. And I think a lot, of, a lot of our listeners and even myself can like, see the value in that and want to like, enter into it in that same mentality. So as we enter in and go through this Advent season, we have a very special kind of feast day that shows up on our radar that is important, big, uh, and extremely unique to our Catholic faith. And it's the feast day of Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception. So uh, on the air day of this, it'll be another week or so before we uh, celebrate that feast day. But um, its proximity to the birth of Jesus Christ uh, tends to confuse a lot of people 
and we are talking about the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary uh, on this feast day. And so we want to take some time and kind of break that down and allow ourselves a, a unique entrance into the Advent season and into the Incarnation from this like special avenue of the Immaculate Conception. So this episode we want to discuss a little bit, take some time to reflect on the uniqueness and the importance of this feast day for us as Catholics, um, but then uh, also rejoice in the reality of the great gift, which is the Immaculate Conception for us. So uh, give us a kind of postcard. Uh, what are we talking about with the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary? Yeah, I think that that's right that you started out the way you did, Father Joseph Anthony, I think, because the point about confusion of this particular feast, that people think often that the Immaculate Conception refers to Christ's own conception, right, right. is important mm -hmm. because all of the privileges, all of the graces, every extraordinary honor that's given to the Virgin Mary by God mm -hmm. is given in view of the Lord. Yes. yes. And so it, it, it's, it, is it ironic? I don't, I, don't know that I, I don't know that that's the right word, but, but I think it's remarkable that people confuse this feast with an understanding of Christ's own life mm. because the reason, the very reason we have this feast is Christ. <laughs> <laughs> so, so right out of the gate, we're, we're, we're talking about the Immaculate Conception, which is a, a mystery of the Virgin Mary. Yes, that's absolutely true. But a proper understanding of the Immaculate Conception has to begin in looking at the, at the Lord and in understanding who Christ is um, because with, without that, uh, without that confidence that this special privilege, which was afforded the Virgin Mary, without understanding that this special privilege was afforded in view of her her place as the Virgin Mother of God, mm -hmm. as the Virgin Mother of Christ, then, then, then we'll lose track of what the whole mystery means. So that's why I think we have to begin in recognizing that, that, that this honor was given because Mary would be the mother of Christ, would be the mother of God. I remember um, when I first started discerning the priesthood, um, like yourself, I spent some time in a diocesan seminary uh, before becoming a Dominican. And I think it was my first Christmas as a diocesan seminarian. I had a family member come up to me uh, right around this feast day and was like baffled. I was like, wait, wait, the Immaculate Conception? Like, how does this happen? There's Immaculate Conception. And then like three weeks later, Jesus was born. Like, I thought it takes nine months for, it was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, we're talking about Immaculate Conception of the Mother of God, you know, and trying to distinguish the feast in that sense. So um, give us a little bit of the kind of like basic intro to the uh, Immaculate Conception, Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So we know that it's a, a grace that's afforded to her in light in preparation for her role, uh, her privileged role in the life of the Redeemer, being the virgin mother of that. But we are making a bold claim here that this woman, the Blessed Virgin Mary, was conceived without sin. Like that's, that's, that's the reality. That's why it's bold. And that's what this proclamation is about. So um, connect her, uh, her sinlessness her conception without sin, and draw that into the role of the Redeemer? Like, how, how is that connection? Why is, this per, why is this part of the mystery of the Incarnation is her own immaculate conception? Yeah, so we say, okay, the first key to this mystery is Jesus. Mm -hmm. The second key is sin. <laughs> okay, so... so okay, we say lack of... Yeah, exactly. Well, here we need to kind of sort some, some things out, right? So... We Christians, we believe that, that after our first parents fell, that every son or daughter of our first parents, which is everyone, mm -hmm. <laughs> excepting the Virgin Mary and Jesus, as we will see and soon demonstrate, has been contaminated by this original sin, mm -hmm. that, the, that the, the lingering effects of this sin perdure down to the present age. And this is, this is what inclines us um, to sin. It makes us weak in the face of temptation and and it sets sets all that kind of disorder which we which we so often face and so routinely struggle against in the spiritual life right that's where it all comes from mm. it comes mm. from original sin and so the idea is that in order to preserve the sinlessness of Christ okay he must have had a sinless mother okay because all of Christ's humanity comes from the virgin mary which is an amazing mm. thing to think about yeah that all of Christ's humanity comes from his mother so we could spend some time in the in the real 
uh, in the real uh, biological mess of that, but I'm not Father Nick nor <laughs> Austriaco, so I won't do that, actually. Uh, so we can rest on that principle. We could say all of Christ's humanity comes mm -hmm. from his virgin mother. Therefore, if Christ had inherited humanity, which had been spoiled by original sin, Christ would have inherited original sin. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of the, the this is the point that has informed the church's theological reflection on this mystery of the Immaculate Conception, saying, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! We know that Jesus does not have any sin. Right. So in order to preserve the sinlessness of Christ, we assert, well, okay." This man received a humanity that was perfect, that was complete, that was preserved from any stain of sin, including the stain of original sin, which is hereditary. Yeah. Okay, so that so that that is really the basic idea here. So there were there were two ways in the Middle Ages that people thought they could answer this question, right? They said, well, okay, we could say that the Virgin Mary inherited sin but was sanctified immediately in the womb. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this was the view of some people like St. Thomas Aquinas, okay? I was going to bring that up, but all right, you just <laughs> so went for it. So I had to you okay, a little bit. Here we go. You know. All right. So, was so it, I'll, I'll just, I'll come out and say it. Was Aquinas wrong? <sighs> it's very, very painful for me to say this, but yes, on yeah, this point. Yes. Okay, but the point is okay. that he was wrong for the right reasons. There it is. Unlike blessed Dun Scotus, who was right for the wrong the reasons. reasons. So, okay, mixed bag there, you know. <laughs> so I, th I think that I think the blind people, squirrel can find a yeah. nut every now and then. You know what <laughs> I, I mean? Think, <laughs> I think that people like to beat up on St. Thomas for this point a little bit, a little bit too much. They get a little too excited about this. But the point is about preserving. So what St. Thomas was worried about was preserving the distinction mm -hmm. between the Virgin Mary and the total and unique nature of the mystery of the incarnation. Yes. So that was what his trepidation was. He wanted to say, well. It made, it made more sense to him to say she was sanctified in the womb, and therefore he preserved the integrity of Christ's humanity, which Jesus would have received from her. Boom. Okay, problem solved. Uh, but as we've seen, the, the church has insisted, no, on actually the more difficult teaching, mm -hmm. the higher teaching. Um, so the dogma was solemnly declared in 1854 by Pope Pius IX in, in Deus, um, that Which is, honestly, that's relatively recent. Yes, yeah, like in, in, the, the, in the life of the church, thing, absolutely. Like, let's call it for what it is. That, that yeah. is relatively recent, and there's been a lot of theological work and study and um, kind of wrestling with this to make sure that we're not just, you know, being flippant about a very important reality and the the gravity of this claim saying the Blessed Virgin Mary was conceived without sin. Absolutely, and this is a totally live topic, right? This informs things like decisions that are being made as they're filming The Chosen. <laughs> you know, like how they're presenting the the Virgin Mary, because one one of one of the one of the ideas, right, is that if you, it, because a, a sort of contest occurs, right, if you say the the Virgin Mother of God is immaculately conceived, uh, to some Protestant thinkers, it would seem that she would have an incomplete humanity, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that she wouldn't experience the full breadth of the human emotional life. And now, and as Catholics, we don't have to go that far, right? Like the the for us, the important thing is the doctrinal point. Um, uh, about what it means with her relationship with sin, namely, she doesn't have any. <laughs> and we're talking. But she no, doesn't have original no, sin, yep, and then yep. beyond that, she has no personal sin. The Virgin Mary never sinned, um, so she she's been because she was preserved from original sin. I'm not sanctified as Saint Thomas thought, but because she was preserved but from original sin, she experienced no sin in her life. She never sinned, totally sinless, and therefore Christ received from her. A humanity that was perfectly intact. So in this way, it's actually a perfect mystery to celebrate yes. in such close proximity to Christmas, because it's a meditation on the sinlessness of our Redeemer. We're gonna get to one thing that I want to I'm gonna throw out there now, so I don't forget to come back to it, because I like to just start talking, and you know, sometimes I start a sentence and I don't know where it's gonna go, you know. So thank you, Michael <laughs> Scott. Uh, but I do want to talk about like how she is preserved, and, and we can talk about that in a few different modes. But one of the things that you bring up, and I, I want to really make a connection for right now, is that we are talking about her, um, you know, her conception, her creation without sin, and we talk about that as being unique. But we also see it in this deep connection to the Christological mysteries and the need for redemption. And how the Lord, in His prerogative, saw it was fitting that the the eternal Word take on flesh and takes on humanity to redeem us. Now that is a recreation and a redemption act, but it always draws me back into Genesis, 
Right. 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 Where in Genesis, we have a man and woman in created state of justification and created state of grace. And then through their actions, they lose that and take on sin. And so there, there's that beautiful um, like parallel, and you can see that in, in the original creation, right, you have a man and woman also created without sin, but through, um, you know, created in a state of grace, but without sin. Well, so to you here in recreation, in this redemption, you know, it necessitated, you know, the virgin mother created without sin so she could give the entirety of the humanity to Jesus Christ to initiate this recreation. So you see that the Lord works in beautiful ways and the, how he has worked previously, he, he continues to re retain that power. And it's not a new expression, but he institutes something very beautiful in the uh, Immaculate Conception as a preparation and an ushering in of this recreation in that way. Absolutely. No, we have in Jesus a new Adam and in his virgin mother, his sinless virgin mother, a new Eve, which is, which is as you're saying, an incredible parallel. I like to, so, so I think sometimes this dogma can become very abstract. Right? Yeah. Like as yeah, we've, yeah. We've, been, we've been talking about very, very high, very distant theology, but for us in the United States, this is very important. That's right. Because even before the declaration of this dogma, the bishops of our country named the Virgin Mary under the title, Mary of the Immaculate Conception, the patroness of our country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we as American Catholics have a special devotion to her. Our National Basilica, dedicated in her honor here in Washington, D.C., is named after the Immaculate Conception. Yes, yes. Here, I think as a kind of concession to this business we were talking about, about St. Thomas, where mm -hmm. maybe he didn't get something <clears throat> exactly totally correct. Uh, here, the Dominican friars have placed our chapel and our priory in Washington, D.C., under the patronage of Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception. Um, and for uh, for b both of us, a place that we really love, yes. Lourdes, of course, uh, and here I'll toss the football back to you, uh, the mystery of the Immaculate Conception is actually at the center of the, the healing story yes. of Lourdes. Yeah, so uh, the young woman in Lourdes, Bernadette, um, she was a teenager at the time, uh, uneducated, uh, poor young woman. And she sees this lady, as she would call it, you know, this uh, miraculous lady, which she just referred to as the lady. Um, and as she started having these encounters and, and visions and apparitions of the lady, um, at, a, at a certain point, um, she, this lady reveals her name to Bernadette and she identifies herself uh, in the local kind of poor dialect of Southern France, she calls herself, I am the Immaculate Conception. And so Bernadette then goes to the local priest, and the local priest is ugh, a little skeptical about the entire thing, as typical, and as we would expect that. And he asks, okay, well, who is this lady? Who is this? And this young, poor, uneducated woman says, oh, she says she's the Immaculate Conception. And I forget the time you remember, remember the years. It was just a few years previous. Just, it was just after the dogma. Had yeah, it was declared. just a, So she wouldn't recently. have, if she wouldn't have been taught this in like catechism. Mm -mm. So there was no, there was no way that Bernadette, who was illiterate, as you said, um, very uneducated little girl, there's no way she would have known. And it was that identification from the lady herself as the Immaculate Conception that confirmed the, the celestial nature of these apparitions and that it was truly the mother of God appearing to this young woman. And that's what convinced the local priests. That's what convinced the bishops and everybody it was the reality of how the blessed mother identified herself as the immaculate conception. Uh, it's such, such a beautiful aspect of it. And so I think, yeah. So, so why, why did I make that point? Why, mm -hmm. why was I sort of fussing about this father Joseph Anthony? It's because the immaculate conception, this mystery of the Virgin Mary is how she was identified by St. Bernadette, how she was truly mm -hmm. known, how the parish priest was brought to believe, as you pointed out, in the authenticity of the apparitions. Um, and, and this identity of the Virgin Mary's, the Immaculate Conception, is tied to the healing mystery, uh, which is Lourdes, the, the, oh where there's goodness, the miraculous yeah. spring where so many miracles have been brought. So, so again, we're pointing out that this doctrine is not just something obscure to put the Virgin Mary far from us, but rather it's for us 
for our salvation, for the bearing of Christ in the world, for our healing, mm-hmm. yes, yes. that she receives this honor in God's divine providence. It's so so important, and um, it, it has an importance and an impact for all of us in, the, in this present day, right? Um, we, we've done episodes on Lourdes, and we can continue to talk about that, and it's not a surprise that we keep circling back to, to Lourdes, but just it, it reveals the desire of God himself to be near to us. Um, it, does, it reveals the desire of our Heavenly Mother to not be far, to come and visit us, to encounter us in the muck, in the craziness, in the chaos of our lives, that we don't have to feel that she's at such a distance that how could I ever um, interact? How could I relate to this woman who's sinless? Well, she's constantly pursuing, making herself known in our daily lives and in our um, kind of chaotic world. And she wants us to then draw near to her son, who is the one who gives us healing, who draw near to her son, who's the one who gives us peace, the prince of peace that she gave birth to. So um, before we uh, kind of draw everything to a close, I, I do want to make this connection because it's something that comes up a lot of times when we talk about the Immaculate Conception and we talk about the grace. We, we used that term a little bit before, the gift of the Immaculate Conception for her. So how is it that this grace, right, that we know that all grace comes from, from the Lord, you know, specifically on the cross and his crucifixion, how is that, can we rightly speak about the grace that the Blessed Virgin received at her Immaculate Conception when chronologically that doesn't make sense? Like that's not how linear things work. Yeah, look, I mean, God can do whatever he wants. <laughs> that's, 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 I mean, that, that's, what, that's what we're left to say. Um, we know that, we know that uh, uh, I kept using the words in view of, right? Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. so uh, part, of it is, part of it is simply that this was God's plan for our salvation from the beginning, that God knew, God is omniscient, God knows everything, God knew that this would, that this would be the way that we would be redeemed. And so all of these, all of these graces were, were permitted, in, um, ordained, ordered by his divine providence to play out for our salvation. So unlike uh, our perspective on eternal salvation, which is temporal and linear, as mm-hmm. you're suggesting, God's perspective uh, is, is not that. <laughs> he yeah. sees everything at once because yeah. he's omniscient. And so the whole of salvation is captured from, from God's view in, in, in one magnificent moment in God's own time. Um, so... It's not a problem for God. Yeah, it's a problem for us. Definitely, you know, and yeah, yeah. And, and worth worth reflecting on it. And I think underscores the power of the mystery that it's not a, the kind of thing we should take lightly. Yeah. right. Like this yeah, is yeah, God. Yeah. This is God saying, like, "Hey, I'm doing something really cool here." Yeah, and it should and it should move us to to adoration. It should move us uh, to to veneration of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It should move us to gratitude for the, for the healing um, mystery of Christ, which we experience in such a profound way. In the Advent season, when when Jesus comes to us at the at the end of the Advent season at Christmas as a little baby, we we experience all this in a very intimate way. Um, but um, but again, our our perspective on this is linear, and God's perspective on this is not. <laughs> yeah, it, there was an image that a high school chaplain used. I remember very vividly the homily he gave on this, and it's always just been seared into my my brain. Is he said, you know, there there's really two ways to save somebody from a pit. If somebody's fallen into a pit, like think of a deep, dark pit, and how do you say, like, oh, that person's been saved from that? Well, you can reach down into the pit, you know, with a ladder and pull them out of it, right? Or as you're walking, you can throw your arm out and stop them from falling in it. To the mm. And both are legitimate. You can say, you know, I saved that person from the pit. And, and with respect for us, you know, we are in the pit. We fall into sin. And the Lord reaches down. He actually enters into the pit. You know, it takes on all things but sin and saves us from that. You know, but he applies the same salvation to his mother by stopping that from happening from the beginning. Oh, I like that a lot. Yeah. You know, so, um, yeah, so we have this great feast day coming up. Excited to enter into it as a preparation for the nativity of our Lord and its proximity is is appropriate in the end. Um, so for all of our listeners, we, we really appreciate you spending time with us, and we hope that this is a great way for you to prepare for the uh, nativity of our Lord by entering in through the mystery of the Blessed Virgin Mary. 
A few announcements for, for this is right now we have a fundraiser going on. Um, it's a fundraiser to help lower the cost of uh, participants on our retreats. So you can check the link in the show notes and in the descriptions to join in on that fundraiser. Um, we, we've had this uh, retreat ministry going on for the last few years, and it's been a tremendous gift to us as hosts, but also to many of our listeners. And through different uh, changes and adaptations for the upcoming year, uh, the retreat costs have, have taken a little bit of a spike, and we're asking to help all of our listeners participate in these retreats. And some of them may participate by donating and help to lessen the cost to have more people uh, enter in and spend time on retreat, growing closer to the Lord. So please take a moment, consider that uh, option if you have the ability to make a donation and help lower the cost for different retreatants. We'd be very grateful for that. Uh, the second thing is coming up in a little bit, in a few weeks, we will be in St. Louis, Missouri for the SEEK conference. I'm very excited for it. Uh, it's it's a, one of the highlights of my year, taking my college students to the SEEK conference. This year, on the other hand, it's going to be even more exciting because we, the God's Planning Friars, will be there on site. We will be recording a live episode in front of a live uh, studio audience, live conference audience, I guess you could say so stay tuned for that content. But if you're joining us in St. Louis for the conference, stop by and say hello. We'd love to meet you. We'd love to meet all of our listeners. Please uh, like and subscribe to God's Planning Podcast on all the different apps and platforms that you listen uh, to this podcast or watch the podcast. Uh, leave us, give us a thumbs up. Uh, leave us a 72-star review. Uh, however many stars you want to give, we will take all the stars. We're collecting them. We're trying to make constellations out of them. So all the stars, give it to us uh, if you don't mind. Leave a comment and share this episode with those that you think could uh, benefit from it or would enjoy it as well. As always, thank you so much for listening. Know that you're in our prayers. God bless. Mm -hmm.